Okay, perfect. So I'm very happy to be back here. This is actually one of my favorite events every year is to come out here and uh, assist you as I can in how to think about uh, the, di the dialogue between, between faith and science and with the, just in, in focusing in on the science that I find the most uh, appealing, interesting, uh, and thinking about uh, which is our own origins and the chemical aspects of that, the astronomical aspects of that, and uh, how that relates uh, to our, our faith and our relationship with God. Uh, so before getting into that, I guess I, I do want to flesh out a little bit of what uh, was said already in the introduction, since uh, as you probably guessed from uh, the, you know, very good attempts to pronounce my name correctly. I am not originally from here. I'm uh, from Sweden. Uh, and the uh, umlauts, which also the umlauts, I guess, should, should betray. Now, Sweden is not a Catholic country. Um, we have, a, like most European countries, we have a long memory. And uh, ever since the 30-year war, the Catholic, Catholics have not been very welcome in Sweden and are for seen as... Uh, you know, one of the major threats to the, the true Lutheran religion. So, like most Swedes, I was brought up in a culturally uh, Lutheran family, but not um, a practicing one in uh, any sort of formal way, anyway. So I was baptized into the Lutheran church, because that's when you get your name, and become registered up until uh, about 20 years ago, when Sweden stopped having a state church. And I was also, uh, by my own choice, confirmed in the Lutheran Church uh, at the age of 14. Uh, that was uh, within a month of being confirmed, though I have come to a realization that I did not believe in, in God, at least not the God of the Bible, um, which uh, led me into sort of a decade of uh, some form of agnosticism. I was never tempted to sort of veer all the way into uh, into atheism uh, for two very strong and metaphysical beliefs that I held then and now I hold with, I think, a pretty strong foundation to why they are true. Uh, one is uh, in moral realism, so that there are really things that are good and there are really things that are evil and they don't depend on what I think about them or what the majority of people think about them or what we evolved to think about them, but there are really good things and bad things in the world. Uh, and the second is that we do have a will to choose. We do have a free will. I mean, of course, there are limits. Of course, we are affected by the environment we live in and grew up in, but that we do still have choices we can make. And both of these beliefs are very difficult to, uh, in any uh, coherent way, uh, combined with a purely materialistic uh, word. So these two uh, beliefs sort of continue to haunt me through high school and into college. And in college, uh, I, I, went, I left Sweden uh, as, a, as a teenager. Uh, I did not feel that I fit in very well in my hometown. It was a small, small town, and uh, I was not, I guess, perfectly normal. So this did not... Uh, fit very well, so I, I decided I wanted to, to move away. And, you know, being a teenager, you don't want to do things a little way, you want to do things as big and dramatic as you can, so I thought the Atlantic was a good, good distance to put between me and my hometown. So I applied to a couple of American schools. Uh, Caltech uh, was the one that accepted me, which uh, was a wonderful providential uh, act. So I came to Caltech, and uh, I stayed an agnostic there throughout my four years, but, and this is an important but, several of my friends were Christians of some denomination. And this was the first time that really I had had people my age who are practicing Christians, and uh, for, for them it was just obvious that that's what they were. And they never made any attempt of evangelizing or, you know, any, in any obvious way, but I think just their mere existence uh, means that you have to continuously grapple, grapple with the question of whether Christianity is worth, worth the while or not, whether it's real or not. Uh, so that's actually something I do try to, whenever I talk to students, um, 
is to encourage them that they don't know what fruits that their witness is actually going to be bearing. I mean, the, I've lost contact with most of the people that I knew in college that were Christian. Um, I don't think they have any idea of like what sort of seeds they, they sowed and how they eventually helped me uh, towards a conversion many, many years later. But my last year, uh, as I was graduating from Caltech, I was uh, gifted uh, a book, uh, which was the Screwtype Letters. Uh, now, the Screwtype, Let Le Screwtype Letters is a wonderful book, right? And even as uh, you know, semi-agnostic, uh, I could appreciate that this, this is a book that has a lot of truth in it. And uh, as a side note, I think each of us has sort of a transcendental that in some ways defines us. Mine is definitely truth. I am obsessive about truth. If you hang out with me socially, you'll quickly notice that I find inaccurate statements very uh, challenging to, to let pass by. Uh, but obviously, it's also something that works well in the profession that I have chosen, this obsession uh, for the truth. Um, so I think, well, for many, uh, I think all people live as if these metaphysical beliefs I have uh, you know, and the moral realism and that we have a free will. I mean, everyone lives as if these were true, uh, whether they are religious or not. Uh, I think many, for most people, it's okay to compartmentalize that, like the truths they sort of practice and the truths they believe. But that is not something that was actually ever possible for me to knew, do, which is why these uh, beliefs sort of continue to challenge me and think about these questions. But back to the screw type letters. Uh, so after reading that, I ordered a second book by C.S. Lewis, which is the abolition, was the abolition of man. Another great book. And for me, especially meaningful because C.S. Lewis in his typical, you know, extremely clear and, uh, and articulate and wonderful way, he um, explained to me why these own, my own beliefs in, uh, in morals and in free will, like what they actually were and what they meant. I mean, I think the, the abolition of man is really about uh, the, many of these same concepts. So that led me to the third book, which has already been introduced, which was Mere Christianity, which was the next book that I ordered by C.S. Lewis. Now, for those of you who have read it, uh, this is you know, a dangerous book to read if you want to remain agnostic. And uh, it definitely was so for me. It took me about halfway through the book uh, before I, which I read, I don't know, it's a short book in an hour or two, uh, to realize that I believed in the God of the Bible. I believed that Jesus uh, was who he said he was, that it was a sensible belief uh, to have. Uh, so that was, uh, I know, pretty emotional day to, uh, at the age of, I guess, 23, to, to realize uh, in about an hour that you had this conversion of heart and mind. And for me, they were very much connected. I mean, it was an intellectual conversion, but I don't think you can ever convert without doing it as a whole, whole person, right? So as the rational person I am, uh, I then uh, sat down and Googled English-speaking churches because I had just moved to Leiden to pursue my PhD. And I found the Anglican Church in The Hague, which became my spiritual home for the next three and a half years. Um, but about a year later, uh, my brother, who is uh, to this day an agnostic, um, he thought that if I was going to do this whole Christian thing, I should do it right. So he, <laughs> he gave me orthodoxy by, by Chesterton once I sort of realized that this was not going away, this, uh, my, my newfound beliefs. Uh, and this was a much more quieter conversion for me. While reading Mere Christianity did really you know, change my life and outlook of the world by you know, sort of a very fast 180 degrees, uh, reading orthodoxy was more of a sort of uh, a realization that this is, this is what I believed. Like this was not a, sort of a challenging or a changing of what I believed, but it was more an explanation of where I belonged uh, spiritually and what my beliefs were. Then it took me another four or five years to actually act on it. It took me to move to the US and it was through a combination of that, we actually had a really good Anglican priest uh, in The Hague, you know, C, really C.S. Lewis style, so I didn't feel any hurry to, to leave that community. Uh, but also, I didn't know any Catholics, and I said I came from a country and a culture where 
Catholicism was not really encouraged. Uh, it was definitely not encouraged by my family, and I said I didn't really have any friends uh, who could sort of provide, provide a counterweight. So it took me to come back to the US, uh, to Cambridge, where I was doing my postdoc, and to spend a year in the Episcopal Church. Uh, that was what actually pushed me over the edge. And uh, for a very, like, I don't want to, you know, say any mean things about them. No, they were um, always incredibly nice and hospitable uh, people, and they really tried to make me feel welcome. Uh, what I couldn't, in the end, handle very well uh, comes back to this truth, the concept of truth. Um, for those of you who have been to an Episcopal service, uh, it is the, the form of it is very similar to a Catholic mass. The creeds are the same, the hymns are the same, what's being, uh, the prayers are mostly the same. Um, but what is not the same is that um, a lot of it was said almost like with a wink, that this is obviously like a ceremonial thing, what we, what we need to say, but it's not what we, we don't really believe it. And this sort of discord, dissonance between what was being said and what was being professed in sort of through, you know, different channels uh, was just something that was too disturbing for me to continue in any, uh, to be, go there in a peaceful way. So about a year later, I did walk down to the local Catholic church and I asked how you do this whole conversion thing. And they had a two-year RCIA program. I have no idea why they thought this was a good idea, but uh, uh, now there's only you know, eight months, like a normal RCIA program. But when I did it, it was a two-year program, which you know, was a good practice of many virtues, especially that of patience. Uh, but uh, I don't know, I, I was there, like I was, as I entered into it, I knew where I was heading. I had already done, man, made, it's been many years of discernment leading up to that. And uh, it was actually, to me, always felt like, okay, this is not my favorite thing to do, but it's pretty small price, you know, to pay for the actual price at the end of the road. So it never seemed too unreasonable to me, even though I said I'm very glad that they have since, since then restructured that program. <laughs> uh, so I entered into full communion with the church in 2012. Uh, got to know the Dominicans uh, shortly thereafter and has been a Dominican groupie ever since. <laughs> Found out that one of my friends from college uh, was in the novitiate to become a Dominican friar around when I was uh, entering into the church. And he's now um, actually a professor in, uh, in physics at Providence College, so very close to where I am. And have spent a lot of time with the Dominicans thinking about these questions and, and working with them uh, on, uh, on how to sort of have better communications between science and religion and where you could imagine the most fruitful discussions taking place. Okay, so that's uh, the sort of com combined spiritual and, well, I guess you already heard some of my scientific biography, but we'll come back to some more of that later. So back to the topic. So these are going to be two sessions on chemistry. And the way that I'm going to be talking about chemistry and chemistry and theology is how chemistry, uh, the role chemistry plays in explaining our origins. Uh, so that's going to be mostly what we talk about today and some about Wednesday. And then the second thing that's going to sort of flow out of that uh, is thinking about our uniqueness, uh, if we truly are unique in the terms of being the only rational animals in the universe. So we're going to move into also uh, thinking about how what we know about the chemistry of the cosmos, how that informs our ideas of how likely or unlikely uh, it is that there is life elsewhere in the universe. So that will be all uh, on Wednesday. Well, today, as I said, I want to focus on um, sort of more macroscopic view of our chemical origins and about how chemical of a cosmos we actually live in. So for me, there are two reasons that I, uh, sort of two motivating uh, principles that uh, are behind the, the work that I do. Uh, one is to understand our own origins, um, where, where we come from. So this is uh, a picture of the Earth uh, seen uh, from Cassini, which is this mission uh, to Saturn. So it's looking through 
uh, Saturn's ring back back on Earth. This is one of these amazing, uh, you know, amazing images uh, from from the last decade, showing our place within the solar system and giving us, uh, which has and the study of the solar system is what is giving us a lot of the clues of how the Earth came to be the planet uh, that it is. The other thing that motivates me is to try to understand uh, the growing population of planets that we find around other stars and how likely or unlikely they are to resemble the Earth and to be hospitable to life. So, th so because those are two questions that I care about, those are also the questions that are going to uh, be sort of foundation in these two presentations when we think about how we connect between chemistry and theology. So before continuing on that, I do want to, I did record this video of my favorite telescope a couple of months ago. And while I am kind of going to cringe at hearing my own voice for a minute, I, it took me so much effort to make this video that I am going to have to show it to you, however strange, uh, you know, it's going to be to have my face up on the, up on the screen. So we'll see if this works. So, so. Two questions that have been haunting humanity for as long as we know is how we come, came to be here, our own origins. And the second one is, are we alone? Are there other creatures like us out there? Uh, my name is Karin Oberg. I'm a professor of astronomy. And I'm so haunted by these questions that I have made it my, my living to try to find answers to them. And the tool I'm using, you can see here in the background, it's the beautiful ALMA telescope up at 5,000 meters uh, altitude in the Chile desert. So you can see I need some oxygen to actually be here and visit it. So with this telescope, we can see the composition of the material that goes into forming new planets and therefore try to figure out how often we get planets such as our own forming around the other stars, that is habitable planets, and maybe even one day inhabited uh, planets. Uh, so this is just a wonderful privilege to get to be part of solving this puzzle, and I look forward to telling you more about it. Thank you. Bye. Okay, so this was me trying to introduce what it is that I care about, but also that we now have these amazing tools to actually scientifically look into our own origins and start to answer questions of how likely it is that extraterrestrial life uh, exists. So that's sort of the scientific, I mean, which... I think in some sense is enough. The scientific motivation, I mean, this just wonder at the world we live in and how likely it is that we are, we are alone or that we're one of many kind of species of rash, uh, within the rash, uh, or ra one of many kinds of rational animals. But the other reason that motivates me and I think that motivates all Catholic scientists one way or another is that by exploring creation, we are looking at one of the many faces of the creator. That uh, the, we do live in a universe that has an author. Um, of course, he works through secondary causes in many and wonderfully intricate ways. Uh, but still, this is a universe with one author and one governor. And by uh, delving into creation and trying to understand it, we believe that we are unveiling something new about our creator. And uh, this is an old, uh, old belief uh, that uh, you can find both in uh, some of the patristic writers, definitely in St. Thomas, and I think it's one that's just uh, obviously uh, true. Um, so if, uh, if the creation uh, reveals the creator, then having um, an accurate cosmology matters, right? For uh, strengthening our relationship uh, with, with the divine, for making sure that we're not introducing, uh, you know, superstition and other things into our relationship. And the, the kind of cosmology that we live in is not something that has been constant over the ages. If we go back into sort of pre, not just pre-Christian, but uh, pre-Judaic uh, or pre-Hebrew times, what we generally tend to find are a cosmos that is very much alive. 
uh, where the stars, the moon, uh, the sun are deities of their own, where you know the nymphs are living in the trees and the and the streams. So this is uh, one view of the of the sky. Uh, it's a Babylonian view of the of the night sky, where you see the sky itself is inhabited by past heroes and and by by deities of different kinds. Now, what happened with the advent of the monotheism and uh, Judaism is the great demythalization of our world, and in some sense, the um, removal of the divine from the material itself. So, where there used to be, you know, a god of the sun and the, and the gods and the stars and the god of the moon, now instead in Genesis we hear that. The cosmos we have is something that's created by a single God in a single non-violent loving act. That the sun and the moon are lamps, like the little lamps that are hung on this, this vault, and so, so are the stars. Uh, this, I think, is a more important realization than the exact imagination of what the earth looks like if we go back into the Old Testament, which is something like this. We have a a dome, a firmament, which is separating the water from above from the water from below. Uh, you have this sort of middle ground, which is where we are living, the earth, which is uh, standing on pillars. And then you have the underworld uh, down below. But as I said, the important change in this cosmology, and this is quite similar sort of the overall structure to the, what the Babylonian would have, would have said, but the important change is in how the different material things in the world are imagined, that they are now creations as, uh, like ourselves, rather than uh, things with inherent, inherent divinity or inherent divine powers. Now, this um, cosmology uh, eventually gave way to this fusion of uh, Greek uh, Greek cosmology and sort of Christian understanding of the cosmos, which is the medieval Aristotelian uh, cosmology, where um, people knew, you know, that the Earth was a sphere. So you have the earthly sphere at the center. Uh, this was not discovered by Columbus. Uh, <laughs> It's actually an interesting story of how this was basically invented in the 19th century that, uh, to make Columbus seem you know, extra heroic, that that was one of the things that uh, you know, he was being fought against by, by the, both the common people in the church that the earth was really flat. But this was the co official cosmology of the Middle Ages, had, had the spherical earth at the center, and then the spheres of the different heavenly bodies sort of uh, in larger and larger spheres encompassing the Earth. Now, this uh, cosmology obviously structurally looks different from one of the Hebrews, uh, but it was also um, an important aspect of the cosmology of the medieval times is that everything has a meaning and some sort of symbolism to it. So if we are um, thinking about this uh, why this is so ordered and structured, that we have these perfect spheres. Now, the astronomers of the Middle Ages knew that the planets could not be sitting on sort of perfect spheres around the Earth. It just doesn't fit uh, with how the planets are, are moving on the night sky. Yet, this is the cosmology that you see, because somehow it represents also the ordering, the providence uh, of God, uh, and the uh, it's important to keep in mind that when we think about sort of separation of science and theology, that's, that's a pretty novel concept. While in the Middle Ages, they were much more integrated. And uh, how you describe the cosmos is going to have to be informed by both when we're looking back into the 13th and 14th century. Now, what happened in the 16th and 17th century is sort of the, the what, if you talk um, to secularists, it's the moving of the Earth from the center of the universe out into sort of the, the like into a much less elevated position, just one of many bodies. Well, it's actually the concern of contemporaries uh, when the Copernican system was introduced was the opposite, that you were kind of pulling down these elevated heavenly bodies 
into the material uh, word. Because if you look at this, um, this picture of the cosmos, sort of artificially it looks like we are at the center of the universe. But in Aristotelian physics, the center of the universe is the worst. This is like where things are being corrupt. This is where heavy, sort of gross things are. And then if you go further away, that's where the you know, evanescent, beautiful, everlasting, eternal spheres are. So it's actually not obvious that you know, switching places of these, that that's actually something that elevates us, at least if we are still thinking in an Aristotelian medieval kind of way. But as I said, this does give, give way to the Copernican system and eventually to a very mechanical view of the cosmos. So if you've heard things like the clockwork uh, universe or clockwork cosmos, this is what comes starting with uh, Galileo, Newton, and the, uh, the, and the Enlightenment. So this is an idea where you know, the, the powers of science are starting to, as we understand it, the modern science are starting to be understood. And the regularity of the natural laws so that you can describe them with, mathem with mathematics is starting to be <coughs> unveiled. And uh, what's, what's emerging is that it seems like the universe is sort of self-going. If you just start it right, uh, then it will continue to work perfectly according to these natural laws that are inscribed on it. And uh, this is not seen at the time as a way of removing God from the picture, but it is sort of changing how God is interacting with the universe. So before, in the Arist in Aristotelian medieval uh, worldview, um, you have a physics that depends on the things in themselves. So, you know, if a stone falls to the ground because it has heaviness, so it wants to be uh, closer to the center. Uh, when we enter into the more modern period, instead what we have is a set of laws that are sort of imposed from above rather than intrinsic to objects, and that these laws come directly from God. So it's very much uh, like we're still in a time where there is a close connection between science and religion, but it is a very different one compared to a couple of hundred years earlier. That now God has, is really the lawgiver. And... Uh, in, he could have given other laws than the ones he did. That this is, this is laws that are imposed from, from the outside. Now, it doesn't take that long before we go from a, a society where God is seen as the necessary lawgiver uh, to that you sort of drop the God part and you just keep the natural laws, which is basically what happens in the 19th century. If you have an eternal universe, which is what people believed at the time, and laws that seem eternal, um, it is not that intuitive that you need to have someone to sort of institute these laws or to get it started. Uh, so it is, while if you go back and read something like the cosmological arguments uh, for God, it doesn't really, it doesn't matter if the universe is eternal or not, you still need a first cause. But I would say it's less intuitive that you need it if you are convinced that the universe is, is eternal. Now, what happens in the 20th century is, of course, that we realize that the universe, at least the universe that we inhabit, whether that is everything that is, is debated, uh, that that is not eternal, that there is a beginning to the universe that we inhabit. Uh, this was introduced by the idea of the Big Bang as the beginning of the universe was introduced by a Catholic priest, Monsieur Lemaitre. Um, maybe because of that, maybe because of other, I say, metaphysical prejudices, uh, this was not a theory that was happily received by most uh, at its time. Um, to many, it smelled like papism and uh, religion to suggest that there was this beginning to the universe sounded a bit too suspiciously like Genesis uh, to many. Um, the Catholic Church was extremely happy to accept it very, very quickly. Uh, actually, Lemaitre was not always as happy about the endorsements he got from the church as that you know, further seemed to uh, increase the suspicion of some of his fellow physicists. But uh, we know now, as much as we know anything, that there was a beginning to the universe uh, a little more than 13 billion years ago. Um, there was a quick uh, expansion 
the details of which uh, is still worked out, but we had this quick, early inflation. Uh, and then we, ever since then, we have had what first seemed like a steady expansion and now uh, probably an accelerating expansion of, of the universe. Uh, there's uh, the times and the distances we're talking about here are vast. Uh, so, so already we're talking about billions of years in time. I mean, that on its own is something that we can't really imagine as human beings who are used to thinking about times in terms of seconds, minutes, hours, and, you know, days, years. Uh, but again, I think uh, if, if a medieval, imagine if a medieval knew about the Big Bang, what they would do with this in terms of ascribing meaning to it. I think that someone like Thomas Aquinas or others, or even the patristic writers, if they found out that the universe was, you know, close to 14 billion years ago, 14 billion years old, and this immensely large, that they would immediately jump to that this being an icon and a symbol of God's vastness and, at, at, you know, infinity and eternity. So I actually don't think this is something that, as Catholics, we should be the least worried about, that the cosmos we inhabit is an incredibly large one. It is also an evolving universe. So the universe as it looked when it was a few hundred million years old is very different from the universe as it looks today. It took quite a bit of expansion for the universe to cool down enough for there to be atoms, uh, for there to be stars to be able to come together and form. So stars form basically from uh, atoms collapsing that are, you know, uh, atoms that are more diffusely distributed to start to collapse in on themselves until it gets hotter and hotter and you form a star. That took some time before you could, uh, that could happen. Um, but after, within a billion years or so of the Big Bang, you do have something that's starting to resemble the universe we have today. You have galaxies, you have stars, might even have planets. Uh, but as the universe continues, for each generation of stars, things get a little bit different. Galaxies look a little bit different, the composition looks a little bit different, and so on. And it is not only in, let's see, uh, only in terms of physics that we do have an evolving uh, universe. Uh, the, actually, before we knew there was a Big Bang and that the universe had a beginning, uh, Darwin and others found out that we have a biological evolution uh, on Earth. Before that, we f the, uh, there were uh, a deeper, there was a, um, the study of rocks showed that we have a geological history here on Earth. And as we'll see a bit more, we also have a chemical evolution in the universe. So in whichever science we look, it is clear that we do have a historical uh, universe, that we have uh, new structures emerging as the, as the universe uh, grows older, and uh, that we have new processes, new kinds of things coming into being and going away uh, as time uh, progresses. Now, if we think about what kind of God there is behind this creation, I think you get something that's quite different compared to the mechanistic uh, sort of mathematical lawgiver of the uh, cosmos of the Enlightenment, which I think is actually the science that most of us have so in the back of our head when we think about science and religion still, simply because, and you know this because you teach high school, we, we mainly stop uh, at Newton when we teach physics, right? We, we don't go much beyond that because that is the foundation for the, for the later physics. Biology, yeah, a little bit of evolution, but, uh, you know, it's limited what you can do in, on a high school level. And the, same, I think with chemistry, most people are just not aware that the chemistry changes over the past 14 billion years. Uh, so we kind of stop where we still have this sort of clockwork universe, where we still have this very mechanistic uh, universe that seems to be in some sense eternal. While the one, the, the cosmos that has been emerging over the past 150 years or so is one that is very different. It's a, it is one that um, has a beginning. It is one where there seems to be an active creation going on, as well as you had this sort of initial creative event. Now, I don't want to 
like I'm, I would not encourage you to try to match, you know, Genesis to sort of developments in science sort of one-to-one, -one. but I do think that it is providential uh, that we live in a universe where there are so many icons of creation that sort of constantly forces us to uh, ponder uh, a creator. Like, it is difficult to not think about why the Big Bang happened, right? Uh, that is a much more pressing question than if the universe was just eternal, uh, which is what the people thought in the 19th century. The other thing that uh, I think this reveals about the creator is that while I mean, natural laws are still you know, a thing, they're very important, um, but what is uh, also clear in this sort of new cosmology is that we have this uh, it seems like creation has in itself a very sp special dignity of getting to be part of its own uh, creation, that there are new things emerging in the, in the cosmos, which would not have been easy to predict if you were sitting at, at the Big Bang. Obviously, God is outside of space and time and knows everything, but it still seems like this is a God who takes delight, and uh, not just in the creating beings like ourselves with a free will and therefore uh, who can you know, make choices and be loving, be creative, but also in the whole creation, having this certain dignity of being able to take multiple paths and developing multiple patterns that you know, keeps delighting and surprising us when we discover them. I'm pretty sure that they also, I'm not surprised, but delight, delight God, um, very much like an artist gets de is delighted when he sees his creation un unfolding on, on the canvas. Now, so, as I said, I think most people are aware of this um, sort of geological, chemical, and physical uh, cosmos that we live in, that those are uh, evolving. But what I want to focus in on is just how chemical our, our cosmos uh, is. That there is a lot of chemistry going on outside of the Earth. So if we look at the, one of the you know, beautiful astronomical images I've been taking towards the Orion Nebula. So this is, you know, if you look at the, at the night sky, you have Orion. You have you know, the belt of Orion with the three stars. Uh, if you haven't seen it, you should go out and see it. It's one of the, actually one of the few things that I can recognize on the night sky. Otherwise, I, there's a wonderful little app for your iPhone that helps you find everything else. But the belt of Orion is pretty easy to pick out. Now, the belt of Orion uh, is a region where stars are actively forming right now. And if you look at this region, uh, at uh, infrared wavelengths, instead of seeing uh, these three stars, you see this nebular kind of material. So these are clouds of material that are currently collapsing to form uh, new stars. If you look at the same region with, um, if, you, if you attach a spectrometer or spectrograph to your telescope and you look at the same region, you see spectra like this. Now, I mean, all spectra are, are show them <coughs> fingerprints of atoms and molecules, how they interact with, with light. So here we're looking at micro wavelengths. It's the same principle as if you look at optical wavelengths, so, you know, you see the spectral lines of the sun or something like that. So each of these lines we can identify with a different molecule. And we see an incredible richness of molecules in this, uh, in this regions where stars and planets are currently forming. And it doesn't matter what scales we sort of zoom out or zoom in on, uh, we always see molecules of different kinds. So what's shown here is sort of a progression from large scales to smaller and smaller and smaller scales down sort of solar system uh, scales. Uh, just one parsec is you know, a few light years, which means it's a distance to a star. That's one of the measurements astronomers use. The other one is an astronomical unit, or AU, which is our distance to, the, to the, uh, the Earth to the Sun. So why do we look at uh, sort of scales that are the same as between us and a nearest star, or we zoom in on small scales, these are disks of materials around young stars, 
Um, if we look at these objects with a spectrograph, we, we see uh, images of molecules where we before just saw images of structure on, on all these scales. So we live in an incredibly chemically rich universe. Now, how did this chemistry come into being? Like, what, when, when did chemistry first appear in the universe? Well, to answer that, we need to go back to the Big Bang that we already talked a bit about, so the Big Bang view of, of the origin of, of our universe. So we have the Big Bang, and then we have here, we have the time scale. So we're basically looking at the first 300,000 years of the universe, and then this, this last part here is from 300,000 years after the Big Bang, after the present. Now, early on, the universe was too hot for the constituents of atoms to stick together. So early on in the universe, um, you did not have any whole atoms. So electrons, protons were kept apart. To have chemistry, you have to have atoms. I mean, chemistry basically involves the coming together of atoms to form chemical bonds. So when we are in sort of the pre uh, pre-atom era, we're not going to have any molecules. But as the universe expands, it gets cooler. As it gets cooler, it becomes easier and easier for electrons to stay bound to uh, a proton or to a nucleus of an atom. And at that point, you can start having chemistry. Now, the kind of chemistry you can have was at first very limited because the only atoms that formed as a part of the Big Bang were hydrogen and helium. So you can imagine that they can, I mean, you have two atoms, they can combine in a couple of different ways, but not that many different ways. It turns out that the very first molecule in the universe was this rather strange uh, ion, helium hydrogen plus. Um, this is not the most common molecule anymore. In fact, it was only this year that this molecule was discovered outside of the laboratory. So it was discovered in space um, in, a, in a, basically around an exploding star. Uh, but once upon a time, it was the only molecule that existed uh, in the universe. Now, if we continue a little bit further, uh, you start having stars forming. Uh, once there are stars, uh, you, you, can st you start forming other elements than hydrogen and helium. So the way that stars work are by fusing together uh, hydrogen nuclei to form helium. That's the primary way you generate energy in stars. However, when stars grow older, they will continue this fusion process. So they will continue to fuse hydrogen and helium into larger and larger atoms, include, including things like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and so on. And once a star explodes, which large stars, they explode very violently, uh, some of that energy in that explosion goes into fusing even heavier uh, atoms. So after the first generation of stars, we have suddenly a much more interesting, uh, like po the possibility of much more interesting chemistry. So we start getting you know, the elements of the periodic table as we know it today. And one of the things that stellar astrophysicists have been doing is tracing back the origin of each of the elements in the periodic table to the kind of astrophysical phenomena that, that caused them. So here we have that at the Big Bang, you have, have hydrogen and most of the helium comes from the Big Bang itself. Uh, things like oxygen comes mostly from exploding stars. Uh, carbon and nitrogen, some from exploding stars, some from more slowly dying, sort of whistling away smaller stars like our own sun. Um, quite a few of these very heavy elements, things like gold, platinum, actually comes from the merging of these really exotic objects uh, called neutron stars. So if you have been following the news the past couple of years, there have been these reports of neutron stars colliding. We can see the gravitational waves from that. So a lot, a lot of the, the heaviest parts would only have been able to form once we had these kind of neutron stars existing. As a result of now many generations of stars and stellar explosions, we no longer have just hydrogen and helium, but still if we were to look at what does the universe look like from an elemental point of view, 
it is mostly hydrogen and helium. I mean, stars do turn some of this hydrogen and helium into new elements, but it's not that efficient. So these squares here are proportional to the amount that exists in the universe today. Uh, so you can see hydrogen, helium. And then we have a little bit of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Um, tiny amounts of things like neon, magnesium, silicon, iron, and then tiny, tiny, tiny amounts of everything else. Now, as we'll see, that the fact that oxygen is the third most abundant atom in the universe is going to be very important. Because, as I'm sure you're aware, a couple of the molecules that make life possible at a place like the Earth are, are molecular oxygen and they are water. And uh, this, uh, having, having those so readily available would probably not have been easy had not the stellar processes that produced elements uh, preferred to produce oxygen in such large amounts. Now, as uh, I think it's important to just take a moment to reflect on that chemistry is not physics. For those of you who are chemists in the audience who have tried to, who, you know, if you go back to your college years and when you try to explain how to solve a chemistry problem to, you know, fellow, fellow physics students knows by experience that chemistry is not reducible to physics. Um, whether this is actually, uh, now, now there are disagree, among physicists, there are different opinions on whether this uh, lack of sort of practical reducibility of chemistry to physics, uh, if this is just the practical limitations for, uh, for us, or whether there are really true new emerging properties once you start combining atoms into molecules that cannot be simply reduced to the properties of the atoms themselves. I think among chemists, there's less disagreement. It's just fairly obvious that there is something very new happening. But uh, and the reason why we can't solve this disagreement is, in practice, we cannot calculate chemical properties based on physical laws. Uh, we just don't have the computational power to basically test whether there, there is sort of something new or, or not. But in uh, practice, what we do see is that if you combine hydrogen and oxygen uh, to get water, you do not get uh, a species that, uh, that sort of combine the properties of oxygen and hydrogen in any simplistic way. You get a molecule that has very different properties from either. And in general, when we think about what defines sort of a molecule, it is as much defined by the interaction of the atoms in the chemical bond, and we'll talk some more about that, as it is by the constituents themselves. So we went from a universe that had only in some sense the the science of atoms to one where you have uh, a to a chemical cosmos that has new kinds of laws uh, that is governing what's going on. Now, once you have planets uh, where you can gather large amounts of things like water into liquid bodies, for example, or uh, comets where you can gather things into ices, you get yet another kind of laws and structures emerging it is actually extremely difficult to calculate how something like water behaves in a group uh, based on our understanding of individual water molecules. So we have this sort of layers of organization in the universe emerging, uh, both when we go from place to place, but also when we, look for, when we sort of proceed forward in time. Now, so I want to spend a little bit more uh, time on water, both as... Um, sort of an example chemical, uh, but mainly because it is so tied to our own uh, origins. So water is, I mean, it's so common, like we're so used to it, but it's actually one of the weirdest chemicals uh, out there. Um, if you try, as I said, to calculate the properties of water, sort of of bulk water from individual water <coughs> molecules, you will not do very well. And that is actually not the case for all molecules. There are many other molecules that are much easier to predict what they do in bulk uh, based on their molecular properties. But water is not one of them. It has all these like, you know, weird properties, like the solid is lighter than the liquid. I mean, th that is not normal. Uh, 
and, uh, and other things going on. Now, in biology, water plays a lot of roles that make sort of the biologically, biological machinery work. So I'm not going to go into details uh, of any of them, mainly because I'm not a biologist and there we, you have you know, a full lecture on, on biology. Um, but I just want to draw your attention to that whether we're thinking about the life of a cell, of transport between cells, um, on uh, just keeping uh, a cell or a body at the right temperature so you can, you know, you form and break bonds the way that, that you want to do, or even at the sort of fundamental reactions, water is implicated everywhere. Um, from protein folding to, you know, moving, like moving of uh, transport of nutrients, uh, what have you. Uh, water is also strongly implicated in the origins of life, uh, mainly because of its um, ability to dissolve many different kinds of chemicals in the same sort of primordial beaker. So if we think about um, origins of life, and I said we'll talk more about this on Wednesday, but what do you need to have happen if we're going to have a chemical origins of life? You need to have many different things being able to come together because we know that the chemistry that underpins life is complex. Now, if you want to dissolve sort of one specific compound, there are many good solvents to do that. But if you want to be able to dissolve salts, some organics, uh, you know, different kinds of inorganic material in the same beaker, water is really the place to go. Uh, this is one, you know, cartoon of sort of water so it's attacking a sugar crystal, breaking it up, and dissolving the, the separate sugar molecules into water. Now, a lot of the properties, or like all the properties I've been talking about that makes water so um, special, comes down to how water binds, how, what kind of uh, uh, bonds that water can form between it and other molecules, and that can be traced back to the internal structure of water. Um, so just to uh, remind ourselves that there are different ways that molecules bond uh, to each other, um, which, which depend on the internal structure of the molecule. So basically how polar a molecule is determine how well it can bind to other molecules. Uh, if you have something like two hydrogen atoms forming a hydrogen molecule, um, these, uh, you, ha you have no sort of positive negative charge like permanent within uh, the molecule, which means that the only kinds of bonds you can form between molecular hydrogen and other molecules uh, are that of these sort of, sort of stochastic, electrostatic, very weak bonds called van der Waals uh, bonds. But if you have something like um, CO, so carbon and oxygen, uh, then you're going to have small differences in uh, elect like how uh, well electrons are attracted to one atom versus the other. And you're going to start forming sort of s small dipoles is the way to think about it. And these dipoles can interact with other dipoles through electrostatic forces and form pretty strong bonds. Now the strongest bonds you, you get are so-called hydrogen bonds, uh, which are formed between a hydrogen on one molecule and a very electronegative atom on a, in another molecule. And one example of an electronegative atom is oxygen, which is why water forms this water, the this hydrogen bonds so efficiently. So this is sort of a partial explanation of why water does what it does. There's, there are whole conferences dedicated to understanding the details of how this, this works out. Because there are other molecules that form hydrogen bonds that should actually form stronger hydrogen bonds, but water still kind of wins at, at the end of the day. And a lot of that has to do not just with, again, the internal bonding, which defines the molecule, but then how the molecules sort of orient themselves as they bind, as they bind together in a liquid or a crystal. Uh, so there's, uh, as I was preparing for this lecture, I actually read some of the more recent papers, and there are a recent study that has looked at how so the pre precise angle here that you get between 
different interacting water molecules that if you even change that by a little bit, you actually start removing some of the special properties uh, of water compared to other molecules. So you get something that's more like you would predict just on sort of first principles if you didn't know that water had the weird, the weird properties that it does. Um, now, water is uh, very abundant in the universe, or like it's very abundant here on Earth. And we can ask ourselves that why water is so abundant. We've already seen why it's, that it's in, in, in extremely important, but why is it here in the first place? Well, one way to explain it, and if you're a physicist, the way you would explain it, is probably going back to this uh, figure here, right? Which just shows what are the most abundant elements uh, in the universe. Uh, and you see hydrogen one, it's a, hydrogen can form chemical bonds. Helium two, helium is the second one. Helium does not partake in chemistry, so we can ignore that one, except for in the very early universe when it formed that weird H, you know, helium, hydrogen plus. Third one is oxygen. So if you're gonna have sort of the most abundant molecules, it's probably gonna be molecular hydrogen and, and water. I mean, that's, that's gonna be it. And then molecular hydrogen is very light, you know, so it uh, sort of took off and we're, we're left with a lot, lot of water. So explanation completed. <laughs> However, if you're a chemist, you know that it's not always that easy. That even if you, um, have the sort of building blocks doesn't mean you always get to the molecule uh, you want to. Uh, what determines whether you get to the molecule you want to from the starting material you have are basically two things. Uh, one is if it's thermodynamically favorable to go to the product. So if this is our starting point and these are two possible products, just two, poss two ways to you know, change the, the bonds to form new species. And this is just shown on the energy scale. This is the, of these three, this here, AD plus BC, is the most thermodynamically favored product. This is where the universe wants to go. Um, however, the second thing that determines whether a reaction happens or not is whether there is an energy barrier to get there. Uh, so this, these kind of energy barriers, they typically happen because it's a part of a chemical reaction. You both, you have to break the bonds between the reactants before you form the bonds of the products. Breaking a chemical bond costs energy. So how much energy, uh, like, and in the way that you break it, how much you have to break it before you start forming the product, that's going to determine the height of these energy barriers. So if you're at a high temperature where you can overcome any barriers, you're gonna go down here. I mean, this is, this is where you wanna go. If you're sitting at a low temperature, however, you might not be able to ever overcome this barrier, and you might instead, you know, as, uh, you being, you know, the chemicals, uh, take this path here with a low barrier that still gets you to a better state than the initial state, even if it's not as good as here. So the question then is, is there a good way to get to water that uh, you know, follows this laws of physics and chemistry? Well, there is a common one that's taught in sort of, I think, high school chemistry, uh, which is that you can get from, uh, to water from molecular oxygen and molecular hydrogen. Uh, we know that with a bit of energy, this goes very well. Um, Actually, the amazing thing is that how many people survived this? I mean, this is like, if you read up on this, the fact that a lot of people actually survived this is what blows, blows my mind. But I'm still very happy we do no longer have H2 fueled flying vehicles uh, around. Um, so if you have energy, this, this works well. We have a way to produce water. And this is actually, is a possible way we could have generated some of the water here on Earth. We do have, you know, weather, like thunderstorms and the like, which could have taken primordial molecular hydrogen and oxygen to something like water. Um, however, this, um, this barrier, if you want to uh, form things at lower temperatures, and I am gonna convince you that we do wanna form things at lower temperatures, this barrier is gonna be too high. 
And the reason that I would like to understand how water can form at lower temperatures is that we see a lot of cold water in the universe. This is zoom in of another region where uh, stars are currently forming, where there's an overdensity of dust and gas in the galaxy. And if we take a spectra again, but now we look in the infrared instead of microwaves, uh, we can see um, solids. Um, we can see ices, water ice, other kinds of ices, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, uh, methanol, methane, and so on. And what we see a lot of is water ice. Uh, even, and these are cold regions of space. We're down at 10 Kelvin above the absolute zero. So there must be a way in the universe to form a lot of water, even at very low temperatures. And maybe having that water delivered to us is a competitive, and maybe even a dominant way to, to explaining Earth's water than this sort of molecular hydrogen plus molecular oxygen kind of reaction. But how, how would this form? We would definitely don't have you know, thunderstorms and, and the like over here that can give us that energy to get over this energy, this energy barrier to go from molecules like hydrogen and oxygen to water. Well, we, what we do have though in space is that we have UV radiation. And what you can do is you can break apart things like molecular hydrogen into, molec into hydrogen atoms. And then if these hydrogen atoms meet oxygen atoms formed in a similar way, on the surfaces of tiny interstellar grains that are very common in these regions where stars are currently forming, you have actually a way to form water that has no energy barrier whatsoever. Uh, based on that, we find that water is so abundant, this must be extremely efficient. And it's also been shown that with laboratory experiments that these pathways work very well. So this means both um, that there is the possibility that the water that we see here on Earth uh, might not come from here at all. It might actually predate the formation of both our Sun and our Earth and be inherited from these interstellar clouds where water formed through this weird, low, very low temperature chemistry. And this just shows the cartoon of how a star like our own Sun forms, which is they start out with a, molecule, with a cloud Think about the image of the Orion Nebula, this cloud of dust and gas. It collapses under its own gravity uh, to form a protostar. Uh, to preserve the spin of the cloud, you also get the disk. This, in this disk, planets form, and you get the solar system. So that's the, sort of the one minute version of how a solar system comes into being. Now, if we look at water very carefully in our solar system, we don't just have normal water, we also have heavy water. Now the proportion of heavy water to normal water is actually something that provides clues that can distinguish between these two different origins of water. The one that was the you know, molecular hydrogen and oxygen on Earth versus having this being delivered from space to Earth. Think about sort of comets, uh, wet asteroids impacting the Earth as a way of delivering it from space. And the reason that, that the proportion of heavy to normal water is this distinguisher is that heavy water forms in excess at very low temperatures. So if you are sitting at room temperature and you form water, you should have the amount of heavy water to normal water that is, is proportional to the amount of deuterium atoms that is in this room. But if you form water at, let's say, 10 Kelvin, you're gonna preferentially pick out those deuterium atoms and put them into water. And the way you're gonna do that uh, is because any molecule, including a precursor of water, which in space is H2D+, plus, it's a weird little hydrogen ion, um, is energetic, it's more stable, it's energetically more stable than the non-deuterated version, and therefore at very low, t uh, you will always want to form more of these heavy molecules. But the difference between these heavy molecules and normal molecules in energy is very small. So if you're sitting here at room temperature, it's too small to matter. But if you're down at 10 Kelvin, even a tiny energy difference between two molecules will start to matter to push you in one direction or the other. 
we can definitely talk more about that, but the bottom line uh, is that the proportion of heavy water to normal water tells you at what temperature the water forms. And when we look uh, at something like comets in our own solar system, we can measure the water. We can pick out the amount of heavy water compared to normal water. We can do the same in our oceans. We can do the same with, uh, in asteroids or meteorites. And wherever we look in the solar system, when we look at water, we find the same thing, which is that the ratio of heavy water to normal water is much higher than we would expect if it formed at high temperatures, in which case it should be the same as sort of the background uh, deuterium to hydrogen ratio. And what all these data points is telling you is, as I said, is that all the water formed cold and was delivered after these planets had formed, or with them forming, but it was not something that, that came into being through these sort of normal processes on planets. And this probably explains why there is so much water in the solar system. So Earth is far from the only body in the solar system to have a lot of water. Actually, it has, doesn't have very much water compared to things like the moons in the, uh, around Jupiter and Saturn, which have a lot more water than the, the Earth has in them. Um, because they formed further out in the solar system, they probably formed with some of this water. It was frozen out when they were forming. While the Earth forming pretty close to the sun, you had to have the water, at least in part, delivered through this impact with comets and, and asteroids. So I want to uh, spend the last few minutes of today talking about uh, a second part of our origin story, which turns out to be more chemical than you might expect which is that of the planet itself. So we're not talking about an important constituent of the planet, the water, but the other thing we need if we're gonna understand our own origins is to understand um, how our planet formed in the first place. So we actually know quite a bit of how stars and planets form. And the first thing to realize is that stars and planets are currently forming. Our galaxy, one of 100 billion galaxies, uh, about seven new stars come into existence every year. Uh, so we are still, as I said, uh, the we are still being created as, as a universe in an ongoing way. Uh, as we'll talk about on Wednesday, each of those stars will have a planetary system. Uh, stars form in these over densities in the of dust and gas in the galaxy. So between stars, there's dust and gas, very little, I mean, it's a very good vacuum, but there is some dust and gas. There are places in the galaxy where these are concentrated, and that's when you get these kind of gorgeous images that we see here of the pillars of creation, for example. Um, the way it forms, we already went through pretty quickly, but it is that these clouds of material, they can become dense enough that gravity starts pulling them together more and more. So you get to collapse under self-gravity. Uh, because there's always a little bit of spin, uh, you form not a spherically collapsing cloud, but sort of a disc-like collapse. Most of the matter goes into the center to form the star, but a little bit gets left over in a disc around the central star, and this is where planets form, like our solar system. Uh, planets form uh, in two steps. The first is that this sort of dust in the disk, it sticks together to form bigger and bigger bodies, so pebbles, boulders, planets. Um, if the planet gets big enough, fast enough, it will continue into the second step, which is that it will accrete the gas that is local uh, to it. So the Earth never got big enough, so we're just a rock. Jupiter did get big enough, so it's a, you know, it's a ball of gas mainly, but it does have a rocky core at the center, which comes from this first step of you know, solids sticking together to form, to form this first, first planet. But, so whether you get these big uh, gas uh, planets or little Earth-sized planets, as I said, depends mainly on if you form this Earth-sized planet fast enough to, um, to accrete this big gaseous envelope. And with fast enough, 
I mean within a million years or so. This disk around a young star, it lasts for about two to three million years before the gas dissipates. So if you haven't formed your, sort of completed your first step within a couple of million years, there's gonna be no gas left for you to accrete onto your, onto your planet. Now, where the chemistry comes in is that it determines basically whether you're gonna do this fast enough or not. So if you look at the, at the artist's uh, illustration uh, of one of these disks where planets are forming, so this, this is it, um, where a planet forms is going to determine whether it can form this first step fast enough or not. Now, what is uh, really awesome is that where I took that video uh, up in the Atacama Desert uh, is that we now have this telescope, ALMA, which allows us to actually see these disks um, around other young stars at a very great detail. So remember the cartoon? That was just one slide ago. So these are actual uh, astrophysical observations of the same objects of these disks uh, of dust and gas around young stars. It's from uh, about half a year ago. And what you see is that, let's take this one. So this is one of the disks. What you see is that there's material where you have this ye bright yellow. So brighter means more material, more dust, more gas. And then you have these dark lanes where there's material missing. We think the material there is missing because there's, there's a planet there that is accreting the material. So we are really catching planet formation as it is happening in these disks around these young stars. Now within these disks, water and other molecules is going to be present because it was present in the cloud that these disks formed from, so it will just be inherited. Um, now it will be present in two phases, in gas as in, and in solids. And it will be present in the gas, close to the star, and frozen out uh, on dust grains as ice is further away from the star, just a pure temperature effect. Now, if you want to form a planet quickly, so you want to you know, get pebbles to stick together uh, as, as well as you can, um, it is much easier to make a snowball than to make a sandball. Is really what it comes down to. So if you have bare grains and try to st stick them together, that's a difficult process. It takes a long time. Now nature have come up with ways to get around that maybe it seems like it should be impossible. Um, but it's much easier if these grains have some ice. So we think the reason that we get Jupiter and Saturn where we get it, which is about five and 10 times further away from the sun compared to the earth, is because where they, in the sort of primordial disk that they formed from around the sun, you had icy grains beyond sort of the asteroid belt. You had bare grains inside of it. So the bare grains led to the formation of these small rocky planets that took a long time. While the icy grains formed these initial planet cores very quickly, which allowed them to accrete gas and then form these gas giants. Now, water is a really important molecule, but it's not the only molecule. So what we get in, uh, in these disks is that we actually get a series of these condensation lines where different molecules go from being in the gas to being in, in ice, and that's going to determine the overall composition of planets as we sort of march out, out uh, through the solar system. And one of the things that we can see with ALMA is not just the, the structure of the disks, but we can actually also image where molecules freeze out, where you have these lines where a specific molecule goes from being in a gas phase to being frozen out onto grains. And this is the first image where we did that, and we did it for CO ice instead of water ice. It's just easier to do, as it turns out. But what you see here is the observation which shows where CO is frozen out on grains, and this black hole here is where CO is in the gas phase. So we can really now, in systems where plants are currently forming, we can say something about what the future compositions of planets are going to be like. 
we already know uh, what, or like what we will talk more about one day is we have a lot of evidence of that planets around other stars are very common. And it's happened almost exactly the same time that astronomers have figured out that planets are very common around mature stars and that we're now starting to understand how they come into existence. But I said I wanted that I'm going to how we know that there are so many planets and that really the night sky is not just you know cold lamps up there, but every star you see is a word of their own is something I will talk more about uh, on Wednesday. Um, instead, what I want to do now is just uh, wrap up and uh, sort of bring back some of the the things that we already touched upon, since I know there are many different moving parts that are coming together to try to address how chemistry affects our audience. But I think it's clear that uh, studying uh, the chemistry at these sort of like cosmic scales is providing clues to our own origins. Um, and one of the things it's revealing about the universe uh, is that the universe has layers upon layers of organizing principles, the chemical being one of them. And that each of these layers are distinct. Now they're connected. So uh, just as we saw with the water molecule, I mean the, the structure of the water molecule depends on the properties of the atoms that goes into making the water molecule. And the properties of water as a liquid body depends on the structures of the water molecules but each of them present a new set of laws and behavior that are not uh, possible to predict in any quantitative way from the sort of underlying uh, layer. Now, there is, if we think about uh, this sort of emergence that we see of uh, the, the chemical cosmos or the physical cosmos or the biological cosmos, we are, I think, seeing something uh, of the personality of our creator. Uh, we do, um, it does seem like creation is uh, um, informed by this special dignity to get part of sort of creating the next, the next layer. Uh, that while God is the lawgiver, just as the, was perceived in, uh, during the enlightenment, uh, the laws that, that seem to govern the universe come in this very complex structured layered way with some only emerging over time uh, as the universe sort of matures and has more ingredients, uh, has more structures, has more displays, more complex uh, behavior. And uh, I think with that in mind, uh, first of all, we need to add to God's sort of mathematician is also God the artist, God the violin player, who you know takes delight in seeing these like themes emerging in different and curious and unexpected ways. Um, but I, I think uh, in, in, that it's, it seems like the universe as it's unfolding is almost more like a piece of art in the making uh, than an equation that you can write down as sort of a single piece of paper. One of the things that uh, we have seen when it comes to the, the stars and the moon, the heavenly bodies, uh, is that we do need, when, uh, when reading about creation, reading in the Old Testament, reading the Psalms, uh, these are seen as lamps, as lights, as something static. Once put in place, they're there. We now know that that's not the case, that the, the case that these are evolving structures. However, I think it's important to keep in mind that the fundamental uh, aspect of Genesis, of the Psalms when it comes to describing these structures, is not you know, their physical origin. It is that they are something that created things that are distinct from God. So that's, that still holds. Uh, but there is also, we are inhabiting a different cosmology than those who wrote the Old Testament, and I think that is important to acknowledge. Now, as I said I th before, I think it also would be good to bring back some of that medieval sensibility uh, of imbuing this cosmos with meaning. Uh, I mean, I said I would have loved to see what someone like Thomas would have written about uh, 
the cosmos had he known uh, that it is something that is evolving over time, that it has so many kinds of structure, that it, it has this very clear, scientifically knowable uh, beginning. Uh, I think it would have been beautiful, and I would actually love to see uh, some, I don't know, modern Catholic theology try, try to grapple with that and bring some of that medieval sensibility back, back into the picture. Now when we know that the cosmos is actually even more remarkable than was known in medieval times where the Ordi did a very good job. But where I want to end is, uh, I think, uh, so this is a Hubble ultra deep field. Uh, one of the things to come back to is that we live in this cosmos that is immense, uh, that seems sort of unruly compared to the more cosier cosmology of the medievals. And one of the arguments that's often made against the Christian view uh, of the universe of creation is that it's just the sheer vastness of the universe. Like, how can we possibly matter in something so big and so old when we are only here for such a little time and are so, so tiny uh, in comparison? Now, it's easy to think that this is a modern concern uh, because the cosmos have grown so much in the past 100 years, or at least 200 years compared to previous conceptions. Uh, but I, I love to remind myself and you that it is not. Uh, Psalm 8 has these lines. Uh, when I see your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars that you set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? The Hebrews had exactly the same concern. Uh, in some sense, the humans have always been small and insignificant. I mean, a human is small compared to an oak tree. Like this is, it is not news that we are small and short-lived compared to many other things in the cosmos. And it's good to actually be able to go back to the psalm and to others and see that these concerns um, we might feel that they're inflated, but I'm not even sure they are that with this cosmos. On the contrary, I would say that we always knew that God was infinite and eternal, and having this icon of his infinity and eternity is something that should give us comfort, not something that should put us on the defensive uh, when, you know, as sometimes some others would like us to be. Uh, and with that, I am, I'm going to stop, and I'm happy to take questions. That's right. Yeah, so if you look at the cosmos as a, as a whole, uh, for every hydrogen, there's about one in a hundred thousand uh, deuterium atoms. Uh, but if you look in the water on Earth, it's one in 10,000. Uh, so there are about 10 times too many deuterium atoms here on Earth compared to what you would expect. And, and that's due to this cold formation chemistry. Uh, that was then delivered by comets or something like it. Yeah. Right, so uh, we'll, just, we'll do the hot mic thing. So <laughs> okay. we'll do our best to pass it back and forth. This is Andrew who's listening on stream, um, through the stream from Atlanta earlier about, let me pull it up real quick here. Um, again, how do scientists know where the elements are coming from and what is the process of determining their origin? Yeah, no, that, that's a good question. It's a combination of theory and observations. Uh, so when uh, we, we understand some of under which uh, conditions different kinds of fusion processes can happen. So if, if you try to fuse two hydrogen to form a helium, that has one kind of energy barrier. If you sort of go up the chain to fuse more and more uh, heavy or heavier and heavier atoms, uh, they have higher and higher barriers. So we know you need higher temperatures to make something like oxygen compared to make something like helium in the star. So that puts some constraints. Um, and if you want to make something beyond iron, 
uh, you are no longer actually having a net gain of energy. You lose energy if you make something heavier than iron. So we know you can never have fusion sort of beyond iron be a source of energy. So that can never happen in sort of inside of a star uh, or evolving star. There you have to have some sort of explosive event that just gives you a lot of excess energy. So we have all of those basic constraints. And then one of the recent things is that when we saw this neutron, neutron star merger, and neutron stars are these totally weird objects, right, where it's just so compact uh, that you basically fuse together electrons and protons to form neutrons, and all you have are neutrons that are stuffed together. So you can fit something, the mass of the sun, into the size of like South Bend. It's like it's crazy. Um, so, so we have observed these uh, collisions of neutron neutron stars uh, and then seen the spectra of those collisions and been able to tell something about what elements form uh, as they collide. So it's a combination of theory and observations. Um, two kind of related questions. If uh, solar systems are still forming, are we kind of a young solar system, a middle-aged solar system, or an older solar system? And then if we look at older ones, does that give us some idea of how our chemical reality of our solar system could change millions of years from now? Yeah, no, so that's, uh, that's a great question. So we are sort of a middle-aged one. So our galaxy is about 10 billion years old, and our solar system is about 5 billion years. So we're, we're sitting there right, right in the middle. Uh, so uh, we actually don't have, so, so some of the exoplanets uh, that we observe are around stars that are older. Uh, but the way to, uh, that it works is basically that stars lived for differently long times. So the smaller the star, the longer lived it is. So if you look at exoplanets around a smaller star, you're more likely to catch an older system than, but if you look at uh, exoplanets around a star that's bigger than us, it's always gonna be younger than us. So, so, there, so, it's, um, so we have some statistics on exoplanets around stars of different ages, but not, not that much. Uh, now, what we also are only the beginning of being able to do is to tell what the chemistry of these planets are. Uh, so far, we can only say what uh, the chemistry of Jupiter-sized and Neptune-sized planets close to their stars are, which are the kind of planets that we just don't have in our solar system. So we're not yet at the stage where we can make those direct comparisons, um, but we will one day. And uh, I think one of the things that people are really interested in is thinking about how would uh, a solar system like ours evolve, mainly physically, because, but then the chemistry would sort of come, come with that. So, so this is something people are thinking of, but we don't really have the, the data to, to address it yet. Hello, thank you for your talk, it was awesome. Um, I just wanted to ask, you said that the water formation in space takes place on the interstellar grains. What are the interstellar grains made of? Oh, that's a good question, <laughs> and where do they come from? I'm gonna assume that you're also asking. Uh, so these interstellar grains, the reason we call them grains is that they're basically sand. So they, these are silicates. Uh, so if you think about, and they're about, a little less than a micron size. So if you think very fine sand, you get something that's fairly close uh, to what we uh, think these grains are like. Uh, we think they form in the, uh, during stellar explosions and uh, as solar type stars, they don't explode as much, but they sort of shed the outer layers of their, of their star as they are dying, so it's basically dying stars, and the atmospheres of dying stars and the explosion of dying stars. Uh, you have very high temperatures, so you have very high density, which means that these heavy elements will collide enough to form these agglomerations, to form these grains. And then as the stellar winds and these explosions of the stars, 
uh, sort of carry these grains into the medium between stars, uh, which is where then they become surfaces for water to form on. And uh, I'm going to assume there was a third question there, which is, why do you need the grain? Why don't you just have the atoms coming together in the gas phase? Seems easier. Uh, but it isn't. And it isn't. <laughs> No, it's, it's even more fundamental than that, which is that if you have an oxygen and a hydrogen atom coming together to form a chemical bond, as you form that chemical bond, you go into sort of a, um, you uh, gain energy, or like in some sense, you, have, you release energy because it is energetically more favorable for the two atoms to be bound together than to be far apart. That energy has to go somewhere. Uh, and if you're sitting on a grain, the grain absorbs it and the bond is stable. But if you're in the gas phase, there's no real way for the energy to go. In theory, you could radiate away it, like re release a photon, but that's a very slow process. So what happens in reality is just that you go into your energy well, like you form the bond, and then you go back up, just as you would, you know, if you had a ball rolling down the well and then without friction, and then it just rolls back up uh, again. So that grain really provides a sink for the excess energy. It's, it's its main, uh, main thing. Hi, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the language of viewing science as an icon. Um, I, I sometimes hesitate to want to glean meaning from like natural processes, because I think you could take that down kind of a very malicious route, like social Darwinism, for example, but what, what do you use as kind of like a guiding principle to, to make sure that you're not corrupting what we know from science and, and using that kind of as a valid icon? Yeah, no, I think that's a good question. And um, I mean, I'm gonna try not to be heretical, but I mean, no, <laughs> no guarantees. Uh, I hope that there are, there are you know, theologians in the room who can correct me if I go out you know, too far. But the way I see it is that you can, I think that what is not helpful uh, is trying to sort of say that, oh, when in, um, you know, in Genesis, there, there is this beautiful language about the separation of light, you know, from darkness to say, oh, they, you know, predicted basically the, you know, that a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, you get this separation of matter and light. To try to make this sort of like one-to-one -one kind of interpretations, I think is not very helpful. And I think there you run into the risk of, you know, that corrupting both in some sense. And also you don't want to tie your theology to scientific theories too closely. I mean, uh, that's something that Catholic Church found out uh, in, this, in the 17th century, and I don't think we want to go down that route again, right, to, to say that the only way that we can have the, the Bible make sense is adopting this cosmology, which is currently the favored one for good reasons. Uh, so I think we do, that's something we don't want to do. But what I think is legit is to... Uh, assume that uh, God is ultimately in charge, that, that providence is, is real, and that it is a gift to us that, he, that we live in a universe which has this uh, beginning. Now, it's not the same kind of beginning as you know, a, a creation from nothing, because there, there might have been something before the Big Bang, but that that is the furthest back we can view, we see that the universe had a beginning, and that that is something that should then draw us back into the theology of creation, still realizing that these are two very separate things, the sort of early evolution of the universe and this creation from nothing, which we believe on faith. Uh, so I see it more as, um, sort of, um, as an ins like drawing inspiration from one into the other. So that's why I think the icon is a word I like using because it doesn't make that direct sort of one-to-one -one comparison, but it tells you that it's, it's a way to have the natural word draw you into a deeper relationship with, with God and to have those reflections getting started. And I think what modern science is unveiling is that there's just so many of them that I think allow for actually very fruitful sort of drawing in uh, into theological reflection. So, I don't know, that was a lot of words. Uh, <laughs>
I, I think that we're clearly heresy free. So we have time for one more question. <laughs> if Fantastic. anyone wants to ask a question. <laughs> There's one more over there. There we go. Hi, thank you. And I'm actually going to wrap it on the theological bent because I'm a, um, a theology teacher. So this has been fascinating, but way over my head. Um, do you, um, by chance, have a place where you speak or have written about your conversion process and how you view yourself as a Catholic scientist, as so, a witness? You know, yeah, there, there is a little bit in a recent recent book about sort of intellectual converts that Robbie George uh, put together. I'm trying to remember the name because <laughs> I, I don't know. I sort of refuse to read or listen to anything that I do myself because it just doesn't seem that great, like <laughs> after the fact. Uh, but if you look look for Robert George and there's something Rome something, uh, it's about intellectual converts. Uh, so there's a chapter there, which is an interview with, with me about some of that. Yeah, because I think at, at the level that we're teaching yeah. students they can have a very difficult time sometimes seeing that you can be both and. Yeah. No, so, so there is that. And I said, like, whenever I give these kind of public speeches, I do try to take a few minutes to sort of put, put in context, like, where I come from. Uh, I'm also very happy to answer questions here. Like, if you have specific questions about how it is to be, like, a Catholic professor at Harvard, how I live out my Catholic faith, <laughs> Do my colleagues know uh, things like that? Uh, I'm very happy to answer those questions. So you, you know, you should feel free to like follow follow up if you're interested in those, or if other people are interested, just like ask away. Please uh, join me in thanking our speaker.